live from Santa Clara, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's The Cube, covering Juniper Next Work 2016, brought to you by Juniper. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE. This is SiliconANGLE Media's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. We are here in Silicon Valley live at the Juniper User Conference, Next Work, hashtag NXT Work uh, 16. I'm John Furrier, my co-host, Stu Miniman, analyst at Wikibon Research. Our next guest is Kevin Mandia, uh, founder of Mandiant and CEO of FireEye, just on stage. Uh, welcome to theCUBE, good to see oh, you. Thank you. It's great to be here, guys. Appreciate it. Um, FireEye, great successful company, obviously uh, went public. Mm -hmm. um, been doing a lot of security. Your firm that you found, Manny, inside the Beltway. Yep. Getting down and dirty on, on cyber. Right. Um, now you see it in the presidential debates. It's on every board conversation. Yes. It yep. is the top line issue in every single company around the world. And certainly the big corporations have either been hacked or currently hacked, don't know it, or are being right, hacked. Yeah. The perimeter is dead. IoT increases the surface area. Mm -hmm. This is the new reality. How are you guys handling that? I mean, what, I mean, did I get that right? I mean, how chaotic is the market right now? So, well, the market itself is very chaotic in that, uh, well, it depends on how you approach the market. When you look at just the volume of vendors, it's chaotic. I mean, I think cyberspace became, or cybersecurity became a marketplace a few years ago where people on the investment side recognize, wait a minute, there's a real market here, there's a big problem here, and I think that we have more cybersecurity companies today probably than ever in history. Uh, but how many ideas do these thousands of companies have? Maybe it's 12, you know? So you, you've got chaos from that standpoint where if you're a, an enterprise and you're buying security, wow, there's more options today than ever before, more promises being given today than ever before, and how many are really going to pan out or not, who knows? From the threat side, uh, I didn't see that side, I didn't know how to take your question there, John, was it from the threat side or the market side? Market side, it's chaotic. There's a lot mm -hmm. of optionality in what you buy and there's a lot of vendors promising a lot of things. Coming to the threat side, I think it's, it's chaotic because there's anonymity on the internet and there's safe harbors to launch attacks with impunity. You don't have to worry about it. There are no risks or repercussions to hacking the United States from certain countries. So if you can just fire and forget as a bad guy and monetize the results of that, why not do it? And, and until, you, know, you can't have a deterrence when there's a safe harbor for certain activities. So I think the chaos is here to stay. Uh, until maybe one day we'll have world peace and kumbaya and everybody's going to be together. So cybersecurity is going to be yep. a challenge for the foreseeable future. And great way to break it yep. down too, on the market mm -hmm. side, there's the, uh, that yep. scene from Star Trek where yep. Captain Kirk says, fire everything. And that's been the mentality of the, a lot mm -hmm. of the companies. They don't really know what to do. They're just, anything that comes in the door, they yep. just fire it away. That bloom is coming off the rose where we're starting to see some narrowing down to techniques. Yeah. Can you share the buyer's perspective out there? Because they're the ones who have yeah. to then pick some tooling, pick some techniques. Right, well when I look at the buyer's perspective, I kind of represent large enterprises, multinationals. That's where I spend my time talking to their chief information security officers. And a lot of them have a little bit of a fatigue. They're like, you know, we've bought a lot of products. We've got a lot of people. Are we using 50% of what we bought, yes or no? And of the 50% we are using, are we using 50% of its capability, 90% of its capability, 10% of its capability? And how do I get all this stuff to work together? What's my total cost of ownership here for real? And so I think that's kind of the, you know, we had the threat environment from 2004 to 2014, all these major breaches we're reading about, we're still reading about them today, but over the last 10 years, people have made significant investments in security, now they're trying to maximize those investments, get performance out of them, get integration out of them, openness. Uh, so I think that's basically it. It's a little bit of a fatigue, you know, some of them are questioning, what do I need to buy? And, but how do I get more out of what I've already invested in is a big thing. Kevin, you made some interesting comments up on stage there. It's good to hear it. Said, All right. you know, when when <laughs> when you when your company gets engaged, mm -hmm. the breach happened typically 200 days beforehand, and right. I, I think you said every single time you, you went in, they had antivirus and it was fully up to date, sure. but the malware, you know, got through that. So, you know, security right. is, is is definitely top of mind for everybody, right. but it, it seems like most of what companies are doing isn't working. So, you know, well, how, how do you Well, it's tough to get it to work. Yeah. Right now, the, the way bad guys are breaking is they really really are exploiting human trust, and then they're exploiting features in software. So if you click on that link, or you open a document, you may be compromised. It, it, it's, uh, we're doing a good job in enterprise security, defending the network, uh, the machines that face the internet. You know, we have a health and welfare system for those. We, we defend our perimeters well, but we have a tougher time 
prevent, you know, preventing attacks hitting you sitting here on your Mac. Uh, because there's that communication channel to you, John. You know, I could Skype you, I can email you. And I dupe you into opening a document or dupe you into clicking on a malicious link. And, and not everyone's going to be a cybersecurity expert. And it's easy to masquerade as somebody else in cyberspace. So if I can just get to your machine with anything, any communication, I have an opportunity to hack you. Hard to patch a human. And that's what makes this a problem, right? You, you've got this exploit of human trust occurring in cyberspace right now. And that's the majority of the attacks that we respond to. And you mentioned the perimeter is well, well right. defended. Certainly that's been a best practice for years. Sure. But now, in that perimeter model that now is everyone's recognizing is gone mm -hmm. with APIs and all those right. safe harbor attack areas launching miss, missiles of viruses, is that the data center in these areas have been unsupervised in, once right. you're inside. Mm -hmm. So that brings up the whole machine learning mm -hmm. AI piece. So can right. you share some color around some of the technology? Because sure. it's not a brute force humans against humans. You have to have, we're hearing CI, right. CI, 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 CISO saying, hey, I got to leverage technology. Sure. Machine learning, unsupervised mm -hmm. machine learning, or whatever algorithms. Thoughts on that trend and where that yeah. progress bar is. So there's only so many cybersecurity expertise, and the analogy I used on stage today is when you need brain surgery, you need a brain surgeon, not 20 people. And, and that cybersecurity can be complex. You need to understand routers, understand the Windows operating system, understand the Macs, understand the Linux and the Unix derivatives. You have to know so much, and there's not one expert on any of this stuff, you know? So it's kind of hard to get that done. And then you're inundated with events. If you're in a security operations center today, you're getting billions of events and you're trying to figure out how do I climb out of the noise and find the two or three things that might be real here that I have to worry about. So we've got to scale those expertise and we got to minimize the noise. And there are two different challenges. And minimizing the noise, there's a few tools we can do. Virtualization is one. Being able to inspect something from a virtual container is a good thing. And, and to be able to dynamically inspect things rather than what antivirus did, which was static signature based. Processors are faster now, we can do a lot more. Let's use virtualization, machine learning, analytics, threat data. These are all tools at our disposal to minimize from four billion, five billion events to the five to 10 that matter. And that's what we have to do. But we're all, we're still learning how that's to do better That's a big data analytics. problem in yeah, reality. You got it. It is, it, it, and it, what's sad is that's even after you filter the data, you're still getting billions of events, you know? Um, so on the compliance side, it's kind of funny. If you want to be compliant, you kind of capture everything and yeah. store it in a big bucket. But then when you want to operationalize security, you realize, wow, the bucket's too big here, I can't even massage it. So you almost end up with a different bucket with more security-oriented events in it so that you can start with a minimized data set. We'd so. love to use military analogies yeah. as well as football. We'll try to there weave we in some football. We know you're a big football fan, but let's stay with the military analogy. A lot mm -hmm. of CISOs want to know who the enemy is. Sure. And a lot of times they don't know. You mentioned there's these right. safe harbors. But there's also not only safe harbors, there's economies and teams right. out there. So how does mm -hmm. a CISO, give some color into that environment of, the, of sure. the bad guy. What do they look like, metaphorically speaking, in terms of the teamwork? Obviously they're orchestrating their maneuvers. Right. They're planning. There's actually monetization you mentioned behind it. There's an underground going on right. here. Right, yeah, so I have a different purview than maybe others. You know, the breaches that we respond to at FireEye are generally the ones done by maybe the 5% of the groups out there that are successful against very security mature operations. So they do break into organizations that take security very seriously. Uh, so I can't opine about the, what I call the drive-by shootings, but here's one thing in cyberspace, at a bare minimum, if you can be hacked, you will be hacked. So if you have servers on the internet, you have to patch them, you have to do assessments, you have to do the best you can. And if you have end users, you want to do some kind of safeguards there. I liken that to back in the late 90s, maybe it was 2000, uh, there was a HoneyNet project and it was started by a guy named Lance out of Chicago, Lance Spitzner. And it was an interesting thing. We just put machines online, unarmed and unprepared, and they would get compromised in 15 minutes. That just shows you there's a spray and pray of attacks automated yeah, by computers scans, every day. All kinds of so stuff. take that off the table, everybody yeah. has to deal with that. That's your bare minimum. So now, what happens if you're in certain industries that are targeted? Uh, you make something that's of tremendous value and other nations want to have it. Or maybe you're in social media where you know a lot of nations can't get to the information that maybe our government can get to based on piercing anonymity behind who's saying what online or who's posting videos online. Uh, There's certain industries that are going to be targeted and it is very complex to stop those breaches. And I think the balance you have, when you have no real deterrence in cyberspace, maybe deterrent for those activities is outside of cyberspace, 
is trying to set what is the benchmark? How good do we have to be in security? Do we expect certain industries to prevent attacks from military units? And we got to sort that part out. But I think that threat is real for people. You know, we've done a good job as a nation over the last few years negotiating with China. I think that the, you know, we published a report from FireEye that the threat has abated from China, and I believe it has, based on all the data points we have. 4,000 customers, the breaches we respond to, whether it's presidential dialogue, the indictment coming from the FBI against Chinese soldiers, all the publications about what the Chinese were doing in cyber espionage. We've seen, you know, what used to be 80 plus attacks a month against Western companies abate down to 10 or less. And you know we still don't know what's fair game, but clearly there's a lower volume. Um, but that's so still that's right policy to work yeah. too, competition yeah, policy and yeah, just getting a better understanding of what's tolerable or intolerable. And you may be seeing that with Russia even today, where it's been alleged the Russians have hacked the Democratic National Committee. There are groups operating out of Russia that people that work with me have responded to for many years, and, and whoever they are, they do this every single day. So they must make some money doing this, right? And maybe. All these activities are a way to get discussions between nation states to, to kind of work out the rules of engagement. I don't know if documents will ever exist, but you see sovereign nations are concerned about cybersecurity as well. The private sector inside those nations are concerned about it, and maybe there's policy things we can do to get uh, better deterrence. Anyway, that didn't even answer your question. I went but, straight but, off on it. Yeah, but Kevin, no, no, that's, that's, that's a, it's a great topic <laughs> yeah. there. And I mean, like, we, 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 we've and looked like, at this, yeah. and it's <laughs> obviously, I, you know, there, there's yeah. so much going on kind of in the right. international space. Mm -hmm. If you pull in just cloud computing itself, right. one of the top questions is, you know, do I need to have, you know, you know, sovereignty in my own government. You mm -hmm. know, heck, even you know, I can. Right. Um, you know, there's to talk about should we be splintering? Should the U.S. government own it? Are we going to end up with every nation having right. their own internet? Um, right. And you, you talk about things like yeah. Russians and the, sure. the DNC hacking. It's you know the international uh, you know mm -hmm. situation here seems just very fragmented. Well, I think <laughs> you know we see this in an abundance of issues. It's hard to be a multinational and say, well, you know, we're going to take the norms and expectations of U.S. citizens' privacy and apply it to our whole company at large. Every country may have different societal norms as to what's the expectation of privacy. So I think you're going to see this issue for a long time because with the internet and the connectedness it provides, we're dealing with issues we've never had to deal with before. So as a multinational organization, this, this data protection issue and this privacy issue uh, pervades the discussions. So, just one other thing I, I wanted to get your viewpoint on is in many countries, industry and government work closely together. And mm -hmm. sometimes, especially from hacking, that, that's things that's right. concerning. Uh, how is the U.S. doing? Uh, you know, do, is government working with business? Uh, um, I, I saw today, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, it looked like Yahoo um, was uh, giving the government access to be able to look at emails, uh, looking for spies. Well, but you know, I think at the highest level of abstraction, nobody wants good things to happen, or bad things to happen to good people, yeah. right? You just don't. So every country, you know, country has a private sector government relationship, and I think that's what drives it. If I'm a, you know, I'm a CEO of a public company. If the government came to me asking for things, you always look at, is it saving lives, is it protecting people? And quite frankly, you have to abide by the laws of the sovereign nations that host you. So I think every country imposes uh, things on the companies that operate within the region, and you just have to abide by their laws, abide by what you're asked to do. Uh, so I can't speak to each specific one, but I think in general, uh, that's how CEOs think. Like, am I helping somebody? Am I helping society? When I help the government, First, you have the legal issues. Second is you want to be helpful. You want to make it a better planet, and people operate a lot in that capacity. Okay. Do we know who the DNC hackers were? I, you know, <laughs> I don't know if somebody does or doesn't. Obviously, people know who they are. I could, I could only tell you what I know or what the folks around me know, but there's a lot of consistency that whoever hacked uh, the DNC operates out of Russia, that they operate on a consistent basis, that they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, and they make a living out of doing it. Talk about the threat detection. You mentioned the drive-by shootings, which is kind of like what everyone needs to worry sure. about. But FireEye works with some of the top enterprises. Mm -hmm. Ones that are hardened with security, sure. who have full teams, CISOs, and everyone is chief information security mm -hmm. officers. Um, what can the market learn from some of the advanced techniques? Can you share some insight into sure. what people are doing? I mean, the old days right. was the old honeypot you mentioned, right. putting servers out there and the people doing right. port scans. Now with virtualization, you got big data, mm -hmm. you got un almost unlimited cloud computing. Right. New forms of deception, new forms mm -hmm. of things are happening. You, what's the current state of the art, if you will? 
I think for, first things first, you look at how people are breaking in today, and some of this is a little tactical, I'm not going out five years, but today what I would make sure if I were a CISO is, first you got to have the moat. You can't let anything from, that's on the internet get hacked by publicly available exploits. So you, you, you protect the perimeter. Moving past that to the attacks that are successful, you want great spear phishing capability. You want to detect spear phishing. You, you just have to. Second, you want to advance past antivirus on your endpoint. You got to do that. Third, you want to make sure you do what I call good credential management. You don't want one account that works everywhere all the time and you're not monitoring its use. You want to kind of limit the, the, the exposure if somebody gets your domain admin credentials. Fourth, two-factor authentication goes a huge way uh, to, to thwart some of that lateral movement. When a bad guy breaks in, what really hurts is when they get the credentials to move around freely in a network. And most people have hardened their ability to detect the first inning of a breach but they're less capable of innings two through nine. And the first inning is that exploit and getting in. Mm -hmm. You know, we all harden against that. But the minute they get in and they get those valid credentials, they're pretty surreptitious on the network. So you want to eliminate that. And two-factor authentication And spear phishing, just job. for the folks watching, yes, is when they, sure. you open up a document, you think it's trusted, that's what you, you mean. Bet. By, okay, so that's yeah. the, the key one. Okay, now the, the ones that are modernizing their infrastructure, because mm -hmm. you, again, the, I think your sure. customers are clearly like uh, the big mm -hmm. banks and whatnot, have big assets, mm -hmm. which is a whole other discussion. But the ones that are modernizing their infrastructure, who are changing their data center, sure. going to the cloud, mm -hmm. have an opportunity to essentially recast security. Agreed. Yep. What's the do-over strategy, or if I'm going to basically mm -hmm. wipe the clates, sleep, Slate, Cla slate yeah. clean and mm -hmm. start over. What is the tactical playbook? What's your advice? So I'll have to give you, by the way, you can spend two days on the, how do I migrate <laughs> to the cloud and include security in it? So let me just go to the highest level of abstraction and deal with that. If you're a company migrating to the cloud and you're a large multinational, usually the first thing you do is you say, let's go with email. You know, it's a you know, high cost internally, maybe someone's better at it. Let's migrate email to the cloud, let's do that. Then you have a few you know, software as a service cloud providers. Then you take your custom apps, your applications, you say, which ones am I willing to put in the cloud, which ones am I not? And then, unfortunately, you spend 80% of your time figuring out the hulking middle, which one should go to the cloud, which one shouldn't, and people argue about that, but you generally get that right. You get applications out in the cloud, and then once you do that, and you go through that pain, you get tremendous advantages. And then third becomes, how do I get end user data to the cloud? You know, uh, people are worried about crypto locker, they're worried about someone breaking in and destroying data. Well, let's get that end user data stored somewhere. You know, is it Dropbox, is it box.com, and those places, and they try to figure out policies to govern that. So in general, that's how it works. And crypto lock, yeah. is that ransomware? Yeah, basically? it's the stuff that you just, it encrypts your drive, your drive becomes useless, your data becomes lost, but they offer for, you know, $500 or, you know, some amount of Bitcoin, uh, they'll decrypt it for you. Yeah, that's good, it's a great extortion yeah. from the security standpoint. All right, so now on the cloud, um, security practices, you, mm -hmm. you're cool with that? You advise clients what to look yeah. for in the cloud providers mm -hmm. like AWS or Google or mm -hmm. Oracle or whoever? Great you want great identity management when people use the cloud, you want to know who's accessing what. I mean, it's going back to the old days when I worked at the Pentagon, and that's what we did. We'd look at who's accessing what. Uh, in the cloud, you get that opportunity to, if the cat's out of the bag on your data, it's an opportunity, let's push it back in maybe and store it somewhere. Make sure you have better identity management than this mm -hmm. distributed decentralized storage that we're living with today. Uh, and then uh, a great audit trail. I think that the cloud providers will always be pushed for. Give me better visibility, better audit trail. Kevin, final question for sure. you. Sure, Philosoph thank you. Philosophy question. How yeah. do you balance the organic innovation that requires from mm -hmm. freeing the data up, because big data analytics right. with in-memory compute allows for really high precision in the analytics, mm -hmm. but you need data, metadata access to get right. signaling points. Um, at the same time, freeing the data right. exposes potential right. security risks. How do companies yeah. rationalize that? Privacy versus big data kind of yeah. thing. Well, I think it depends on industry and what kind of data you need. Nobody, you know, big data can be a challenge as well. You know, it's annoying to look for a needle in a haystack and that's what we were doing even before big data analytics was capable. So, I think in different industries you look for, if I'm doing security, what are the security relevant things I need to make decisions? And let's at least get those in one place and let's do the analytics on that. And try to separate it from maybe the compliance bucket where some industries for yeah. compliance reasons have to store everything for a certain amount of time. So long story made short, my answer is it depends. <laughs> final, final question since I just had one pop in yeah. my head. <laughs> there you uh, go. All the action we saw at VMworld this mm -hmm. year, VMware show and then Oracle Open World, mm -hmm. you're starting to see uh, security on the chip to the app, right, end sure. to end. 
hypervisor going away on the Oracle side, VMware's right. trying to put the hypervisor in the network. It's all going to the network. The network is where the action is. Mm -hmm. Is that the last hope, last passion of, that needs to be dominated? Is that where the action is? Is that where the most opportunities are? Is that the last mile of security? So I think, it, so the answer is network and endpoint both matter, but you always get the network first, and, any, and I've lived through this throughout my career where it's always cheaper and easier, well I don't know if it's easier, but it's definitely cheaper usually to get network visibility. Networks are managed, endpoints are hard to manage. You never have an exact number. Am I managing 80% of my endpoints at my company or 10%? You never know what visibility you have. But on your network, you usually can get that. Here's where our offices are, here's where our cloud providers are, here's at least the cloud yeah, providers Things move on the network so you can you see it. it. You can, but there's also a thing called encryption, and then you have to decrypt it, but encryption's free. Any end user can grab encryption and you can't decrypt it. So, even as the, you know, the person providing the bandwidth. So, it's a tough challenge and that's why you want both. Because another thing, when you take network-based countermeasures, the end users are sitting there going, why can't I print or why can't I get to the web? The, it's the endpoint security aspect that allows you to flip up a message saying, hey, you currently may have a security problem and you've been blocked from the internet. So in concert is perfect. People have been chasing network and endpoint in concert you know, for a long time now. It's just hard to do. So, uh, it's but, a hard problem. But, so you kind of want both. Uh, and you're always chasing both. But the network is the one where you should get 100% visibility, whether it's encrypted or not. You, it's you, a lot of action on the network layer Absolutely. right now. Absolutely, you got to have it. Yeah. All right, Kevin, thanks so much for spending the time sure. here at the, at the Juniper Netsworks User Conference. This is theCUBE, bringing all the live coverage from the event here in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. We'll be back with more after this short break. Thank you.